Rise and Shine History Buffs. This is the Monday Morning General Podcast, where we give you the play-by-play and analysis on battles from military history. My name is Brendan Forrest, and here with me is Bjorn Olson. Hey. <laughs> it's Sam DeCosmo. Hey. Bjorn sounds very hey, enthusiastic man. to be here today. Hey. <laughs> Super excited. Super hey. Excited. Oh, we are excited here. Today, we are diving into the Napoleonic era with part one of our series on the Battle of Austerlitz. We will discuss the War of the Third Coalition and today specifically the Ulm campaign. Um, Bjorn, I know like you have some history reading up on Napoleon. You're a big Total War Napoleon guy. Uh, like, yeah. So what is your like your just initial impression of the Napoleonic era before we get um, into this battle? Yeah, absolutely. Napoleon, one of the most spectacular generals in history. This is one of those almost irrefutable concepts that you can have. But he's also on the cutting edge of technology. We're entering into the Industrial Revolution. We're now making things better. We're making things easier. You get canned meat for the first time coming into this. Uh, Louis Pestier and his canned meat. He fixes the canned meat problem during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, You're also seeing for the very first time massive armies. These are no longer 30,000 man professional armies that are incredibly expensive. It's the levee en masse. It's every citizen must be a soldier and every soldier must be a citizen. It's a real exciting time. The concept of maneuver, the concept of logistics, everything meshes together. It's a really exciting, really awesome time period. I think it's important to remember that it's exciting for us from a military history (laughs) perspective, but it probably was not exciting for all the people that under the concept of total war for the first time, where everybody had to literally work towards the war effort. That probably was not exciting for them. Maybe not, but for us, super exciting. Super exciting. So (laughs) yeah, let's get into it. So. In 1805, Europe stood on the brink of a titanic clash between the French Empire under Napoleon Bonaparte and a coalition of powers seeking to curb his meteoric rise. Since seizing power in 1799, Napoleon had hobbled foe after foe, expanding France's borders and influence across the continent through brilliant generalship. Now, an impatient Austria sought to strike the first blow against the undefeated emperor in hopes of reversing the tide. But... Napoleon was poised to unleash his military genius against the combined might of Europe's greatest empires. At the head of the lethal Grand Army, he would demonstrate unrivaled strategic acumen, flexibility concentrating force against divided enemies through bold maneuver and fast marching on interior lines. The stakes could not have been higher, with the mastery of the continent and the fate of dynasties hanging balance. In the looming clash, there could be only one victor. Through a lightning campaign of relentless momentum, Napoleon would gain the upper hand and place his rivals at his mercy. Yet the path ahead remained fraught with adversity, even for history's greatest captain. New challenges and sacrifices lay around every turn before final victory could be seized. We're going to jump into what leads up into this War of the Third Coalition and where Napoleon really set his mark as the commander-in-chief of and French for, Empire. For, I, I love that it's called the War of the Third Coalition, which implies that there was a War of the First Coalition. Yes. And war of the second coalition. And guess what? There's going to be a war of the fourth coalition. And I think even the fifth coalition. And all of these coalitions are literally just to take down Napoleon. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's pretty incredible that it's basically Napoleon against the world. And he, I think he's loving it. Yeah. So let's talk about how we get to the war of the third coalition. We're going to dump you here. Like we don't have time to talk about the first and really <laughs> much of the second, but we'll talk about the end of the second here right now. By 1802, after nearly a decade of exhausting warfare, Britain and France were both ready to seek peace. This led to the signing of the Treaty of Amiens, an attempt to halt ongoing hostilities, restore balance, and enable economic and social recovery. Since 1792, revolutionary France had fought a series of wars against shifting alliances of European powers. Early French victories under ambitious generals expanded its borders and influence, but ongoing conflicts were also destabilizing France internally. By 1797, despite military success, political chaos, and economic turmoil during the Directory period, left France reeling. British bankrolling of coalition after coalition, like Sam had mentioned, against France was also becoming burdensome. Thus, when Napoleon Bonaparte rose to power through a coup in 1799, both sides welcomed a chance for peace. Which is super interesting because when you think, like, thinking about France's history up until then, um, Mike Duncan has a fantastic revolutions podcast on the French Revolution, so if you're interested in this time period, definitely give that a listen. But France is not like... Mike, you're welcome for the, the audience coming your way. (laughs) <laughs> but like france is not in a good spot right now they have been in about 15 years of revolution, revolution. And bloody 
dictatorships and people and it's just, and political uncertainty. So it's, it's they're not in a good spot. So that's I, I think that's part of why they they wanted a chance for peace. But at the same time, like looking at what they're going to do in the first and second and third coalition, it's, it's pretty astounding what France was able to cobble together given their very recent past. But it's important at the same time to understand that this is, like I said, we're moving into a sub from a subsistence farming to a surplus farming. The populations mm. of Europe are doubling at this point in time. France is the second most populated country in Europe, second only to Russia, and their their population doubles. The English, their uh, their average wage is going to double over the the hundred years of the 1700s. So we're seeing a massive increase economically, population wise. And what's really astounding is that when the French come up with their levee en masse, they can pull in 750,000 eligible men into their army. So for that 10-year period of time when they're just being devastated by war, devastated economically through all this revolution, they still have a sizable army. It's just how do you feed them? How do you arm them? How do you have enough men to fight against all these coalitions that are coming at them. That's the real impressive part. But you're right. After 10 years, this is this is brutal. Yeah. So for Britain here, after 10 years, they had pressing pressing issues at home and abroad made peace attractive for them here. So a decade of costly warfare had strained their finances. Maintaining naval superiority was expensive and the economy was crippled by disrupted trade and bad harvests. Britain also held few bargaining chips. Its allies had made separate pieces with France or had been defeated. Only Britain remained in conflict, and threats of French invasion hung over the island nation. However, anti-French sentiment still ran high among British elites. Some felt France had benefited at each piece through aggressive tactics and should be pressed harder. But public and political exhaustion overrode those voices. Across the Channel, similar motivations drove France's desire for peace. Despite expansion under Napoleon, constant warfare had drained French resources and morale. A decade of political chaos had torn its social fabric and revolutionary fervor had faded into weariness and longing for order. Again, you got to put yourself in the shoes of just the regular French people. Because like Bjorn said, like what Napoleon is ushering in is the era of total war. And they, the average person just doesn't, oh, this person's in charge this week. Cool. Like they, there's been so much political upheaval. They don't know who's in charge. And at every turn, they're the ones that are taking the brunt of that, whether it's seizing their assets or another bloody Sunday in the streets or what, whatever. It's really the French people that are suffering here. And so for them to, what they are itching for peace. Yeah, so Napoleon knew further gains were unlikely while England's navy strangled French colonies and trade. And only peace would allow him to consolidate power domestically and undertake much needed reconstruction. France's dominance on the continent was now evident. Its armies had humbled coalitions from Austria, Prussia, and lesser German states. Only grudging recognition of the supremacy by Britain was still lacking. Napoleon also believed prolonging conflict served England's interests more than France's. Letting Britain come to terms first would paint France as the aggressor if it continued warring alone. Thus, Napoleon pressured his negotiators to make concessions to Britain while terms favored France. Napoleon wanted to be seen compromising for peace. Gambling this posture would strengthen his political position. In March 1802, after after difficult negotiations, the Treaty of Amiens was finally signed. On the surface, the treaty appeared a triumph for France. Britain agreed to significant concessions, returning several territories seized during the war. This included the valuable West Indies colonies, Spain's colony of Trinidad, and Egypt, which had recently been retaken from the French. Malta in the Mediterranean would also be handed back over to the Knights of St. John, removing an important British naval base, which enabled power projection far beyond the continent. In exchange, France merely had to withdraw its forces from the ports of Naples and the Dutch Batavian Republic, a client state. French control over Belgium, the Rhineland, and northern Italy was accepted. Just a real quick pause here. The Knights of St. John, that's the Knights Hospitler. Those are the dudes who were part of the Crusades. So we're talking mm -hmm. like oh, 800 years ago. The bad guys um, in the first Assassin's Creed. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Nice. Good rep. Good historical. So, right. but lo looking at this treaty, it's pretty one-sided in France's favor. There's a, some significant concessions by by Britain, and all France has to do is what vacate a couple of ports. That's basically it. Yeah, that's insane. But they get peace. They get, they peace. get peace. Yeah. 
Yeah, so these meager compromises from France revealed Britain's eagerness for peace at any cost. Yet despite general popular approval of the treaty, tensions lingered below the surface. Bag wording around certain points, so confusion over specifics each side was to honor. Fundamentally, a lack of trust remained between the two rivals. France suspected Britain of trying to maintain influence in Italian territory promised to France. Napoleon saw British refusal to promptly vacate Malta as evidence of imperial double-dealing. For its part, Britain harbored doubts about French intentions in Holland and grew alarmed by Napoleon's ongoing military occupation. Fear spread that France would dominate the Low Countries and all continental Europe if left unchecked. Months after signing the treaty, both sides were taking provocative actions that neared violation of the loosely framed agreements. Minor diplomatic and military incidents gradually escalated tensions. So by May of 1803, renewed naval skirmishing erupted into open hostility. Napoleon had concluded that a first consul cannot be likened to a king. His actions must be dramatic, and for this war is indispensable. He believed only dominance through warfare would secure France's status. I love that quote by Napoleon. He just can't sit back and be a king, right? And, and right. have this hereditary thing and this, this power brought to him by God. He has to go and take it for himself, like a general, like a consul, right. like an emperor. With the Treaty of Amiens in tatters, Britain immediately began seeking new allies to oppose French ambitions. But its progress was slow. Prussia and Austria had no desire to renew the struggle so soon against a formidable foe. Russia, however, took a growing interest in curbing France's expansionism. Tsar Alexander saw Napoleon as a rival continental dictator, and France as a threat to Russian influence in the Mediterranean. Britain and Russia cooperated to contain French ambitions in the area, forming the nucleus of a new coalition. But Austrian and Prussian neutrality left France still largely unchecked on land. It took further provocative acts to draw Austria and Prussia in. The brazen kidnapping and execution of a Bourbon royal, the Duke of Enghein, sparked outrage across monarchist Europe. Next, Napoleon crowned himself Emperor of France in a lavish ceremony intended to legitimize his position. This directly threatened Austrian Emperor Francis's ancient claim as heir to the Holy Roman Empire. Napoleon crowned himself. I believe the ceremony was the. This wasn't the. This wasn't a ceremony with the Pope, was it? This was just Napoleon crowning himself. I, don't know. Yeah, I think the Pope was there. Yep, I yeah. believe the Pope was there, and he's crowning himself the emperor. And so I think how the way the story goes, the Pope, because the crown is something that is supposed to be dictated from God, right? Like, this is a divine right that has been bestowed upon you. And so by the Pope crowning them, that, that, that shows that. Now, Napoleon takes a different stance. He says, no, I'm crowning myself. I am putting myself here. I am earning this position. And it's just a start in stark contrast to what all the other monarchies of Europe are doing right now. And it's super interesting. I think Napoleon understanding the past 15 years of revolution in France, I think the line he said was, I found France's crown in the gutter and I claimed it for myself or something. It was something along those lines, but just an incredible and unprecedented move by Napoleon here. Finally, Napoleon invaded the Republic of Genoa and declared himself King of Italy, openly violating prior treaties and Austrian regional dominance. Now even cautious Austria was riled to action. So in April 1805, Austria, Russia, Britain, all historic rivals, now united against the Emperor Napoleon. An opportunistic Sweden and Naples also joined the alliance against France. The stage was set for a titanic clash of empires, Napoleon's Grand Army versus a motley alliance of monarchies seeking to extinguish his ascendance. Motley is a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, they, they're not a cohesive unit by any means, no. which we'll, no. we'll learn through this rest of this episode and into next episode. Bjorn, do you have any final thoughts on the second coalition, this Treaty of Amiens and the leading into this war, the third coalition? Sure. So what I would say is that throughout all of this, I do not believe Napoleon at a single time believed that this treaty was going to last. There was no way that he was going to put himself into this position. He was going to consistently be pushing the envelope. This guy is known as a planner. And so getting himself a, a minute to breathe and create another plan for a, a campaign, there's a story that says every time before Napoleon would endeavor on a new campaign, he would shut himself into his office and he would lay out every single possible contingency that he could ever think of. He'd have massive maps brought in, they'd lay them on the floor, and he would make stacks and stacks of paper if they do this, then I do this. If they do this, then I do this. Here's how I'm going to do this. 
and at all times he remained in control of the situation and his brilliant ability to remember his memory was spectacular and that it was all just shut away and every contingency was basically followed there there are instances where um, they would look back at the after action report of how the battle actually turned out and it followed very closely with some of the contingencies if they do this then i'll do this if they do this then i'll what's do this. super interesting like that is that is a certain level of genius that is incredible what i think is even more telling of his greatness is that it's great to develop all these contingencies but if your subordinate commanders don't know them and if your soldiers mm-hmm. on the ground don't know them then they're not worth anything so not only was he able to make those but he was able to com- to communicate those to his subordinate commanders and have them be able to rehearse and execute those that that speaks volumes to his ability as well. All right, I'd like to move into talking about the Alm campaign in this war of the Third Coalition. And before we do that, just want to cover each of the armies briefly: Austria, Russia, and uh, and the French army here, just to give us some context of who these armies are. Let's start with let's start with the Austrian. In 1805, the Austrian army under General Mack hoped recent reforms would restore capabilities after repeated defeats by France. However, Morale remained low after harsh losses and systemic flaws persisted. Mack commanded approximately 72,000 men, many of which were new recruits and conscripts. The infantry was organized into 56 battalions, drilled in rigid linear tactics focused on formation and volley fire. The 32 cavalry squadrons conducted frontal charges rather than flexible maneuver. Artillery utilization lacked behind French innovations in mobility and massing firepower. So the cavalry squadrons at this time doing frontal charges, that is antiquated for this time. Not just like modern, how modern cavalry is, but like cavalry squadrons have been used for flexible maneuver for hundreds of years before this. So this is just, this just shows like they were not, the Austrians were not up to par with the current military strategy tactics. But at the same time, this, the idea of a cavalry charge, the romanticism of it, it, it ends here. This is basically... The last time in warfare where you are going to see cavalry on a grand scale conducting charges, infantry forming squares, it's still capable of, of occurring in the Napoleonic time period. You, but even then, even when they were used for frontal charges, it was more for a route. It wasn't for front on right. front combat. But fast forward 50 years and you're never going to see right. cavalry oh, charges. Absolutely. Absolutely. Promotion in the aristocratic officer corps was based on social status and wealth rather than merit or skill. That's so result, dumb. It is so dumb. That is like, oh, it, like, you're, it is. You're, you kidding you, me? like you're risking your empire, your country, or your capital, whatever For it is, the boys. lives of your soldiers on, on aristocratic social status and wealth. Yeah. The fancy Buying boys your have more to lose. The fancy boys have more to lose. If they lose, then they lose their fanciness. So yeah. Okay, but they're, if they don't know what they're doing, then they're going to lose anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> this resulted in privileged but incompetent commanders buying high commissions. So, oh, yeah, no. competent, they, yes. they had to have been Dang. at least minorly competent, right? Emperor Francis also rejected reforms to the ossified leadership and outdated tactics proposed by Archduke Charles, the Minister of War. Charles doubted the army's readiness for war, but was sidelined for Mac. Mac hastily, Mac hastily implemented structural reforms as war loomed, increasing the number of infantry battalions and cavalry squadrons without c- adequately considering tactical implications or training. So as they're getting ready to fight Napoleon, they're making all these changes to their battalion structures and they did train. Right? Look, I, Matt, there's a lot to be critical for of Mac and not training is definitely part of that. But I, I get the restructure because he's going to be outnumbered by Napoleon. He needs to be able to be a little bit more maneuverable. Yeah. And so by restructuring it, that, that allows them to do that. But you can't do that if you don't have enough time to, to train and rehearse in yeah. those, in that formation. And so it's just, it's, yeah, it was not. It Someone should have made a quick enough. PowerPoint just to update it. <laughs> a quick PowerPoint. Just a couple slides. That's right. Make sure it's an aerial font. So let's talk about that change quick. So Mac introduced a new two rank infantry formation and reduced battalion size from six to four companies to allow more even regimental organization. But these changes required extensive retraining, which was not conducted. The rush reforms meant regiments had to assimilate major organizational changes while mobilizing on the march into Bavaria. The army was thus disorganized and under strength from the outset. But here's the thing. These are not bad 
changes. These are not right. No. they're not bad changes. Going to from a three rank to a two rank infantry formation allows for a lengthier line, more firepower, shot down range. It's a better way. The British played it that way. Now the Austrians can. But it's a bad time for it. It's a bad time. time. How do you learn to wheel right when you have no idea what you're you don't know what a wheel is? Exactly. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So at higher levels, the Austrian army utilized flexible mission oriented formations rather than permanent divisions like the French. This required constant regimental reshuffling, hampering unit cohesion and familiarity between commanders and troops. What battalions am I in charge of today? What what division do I have? That's oh, basically how it was, right? The army was centered around these aristocratic fancy boys, and then they would get units assigned into them instead of the fancy boys being assigned into the cohesive unit structure already. They were just playing zone defense is what they're I suppose that was one good thing about the French Revolution was that there were no more fancy boys. It was right. just... They Napoleon. killed all of the fancy boys. Yeah, they killed them all. <laughs> La Madame Guillotine had a great time with the fancy boys. Oh, man. The... <laughs> Zip thud the end. Whoa, okay. The regular infantry had a reputation for solid performance, but now had to rapidly adapt to new battalion structures while learning to forage on the march rather than drawing from an adequate supply train. Oh, I hate that. I hate yeah. foraging for supplies. Yeah. But Napoleon, that's how Napoleon did it. So the Austrians are like, we got to emulate Napoleon. Also, this guy knows what he's doing. By the time the Battle of Ulm takes place, they are like... Yes, I, I understand that from a marching on foot standpoint, you're pretty far from Vienna, but they're not as far from Vienna as France is from Paris. France is much farther. And so it's just, mm-hmm. it's the Austrian army just had, they just had no chance. That was the Austrians. Let's shift focus now and talk about the Russians. So in 1805, the Russian army was still recovering from extensive officer purges and tumultuous reforms under Tsar Paul's volatile reign from 1796 to 1801. What do you think those Paul. officer purges meant? Do you think that was, do you think they just sent them the to a uh, summer camp? Russian, and, Russians yeah, always summer like camp in Siberia, purge. probably. <laughs> the Russians always like to purge their officers. Hey, you need a good purging every once in a while. <laughs> Tsar Paul's mercurial leadership had confused the army with arbitrary uniform changes, dismissal of experienced officers, and erratic policy shifts. I didn't have a chance to look up what the uniform changes were, but apparently he had moved them into uniforms that were extremely uncomfortable, almost impossible to fight in. So it was like, like when you picture like really fancy military uniforms, that's basically, they went to war in dress uniforms instead of like actual like combat fatigue. Yeah, not good. So Paul was assassinated in 1801 because uh, he was not a good czar. (laughs) Wonder why. His successor, Tsar Alexander, aimed to gradually rebuild the weakened army through steady reforms. But the damage from Paul's purges left lingering effects in 1805. On paper, Russia could summon over 400,000 soldiers, but maneuvering such vast numbers across the empire's sparsely populated expanse was impractical. Only about 135,000 were readily deployable in Central Europe. Because remember, Russia is huge and they got units spread all over the place and they don't really have railroads yet. They don't really have great road systems. And so there there are no railroads yet. No railroads yet. Yeah, it's almost impossible to have any sort of quick movement and coalescing of forces to to move against Napoleon. So, yeah, on paper, they're a huge army, but in reality, only 135,000 were deployable. Which so is these, fine, because if you yeah. add that to max 72,000, you've now yeah, outnumbered like 200,000. Exactly. Yeah. We'll talk about how that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Russian troops were organized into 77 musketeer regiments and 20 Jaeger regiments of light infantry with three, four company battalions each. There were also six, I don't know how to say this word. That's a Kyrie nice word. Kyrie uh, Kyrie 26 Dragoon, nine Hussar, and four light cavalry regiments, plus some Cossacks. Is there anything that we need to know about those different types of cavalry? Or we, could we just like yeah, boys and horses? I mean, you're basically just talking about like light, different. light cavalry, heavy cavalry, and then guys with guns. On and then horses. like scouts. Yeah, okay. Like the dragoons are, those are the dudes who ride to the battle, get off the horses and shoot. Oh, okay. Like the Romans at Canai. Yeah. Yep. And then some of them have like heavy breastplates. Others okay. don't have breastplates. Infantry and cavalry had proven capable in past wars when ably led, but Paul's volatility had culled many experienced officers like Purges do. The remainder were of inconsistent quality, with some outstanding, but others promoted young without gaining any expertise. 
Reforms focus on gradually improving training, morale, and unit organization. But four years did not fully overcome the lingering effects on combat leadership from Paul's disruptive reign. The logistical support systems remained outdated compared to France's refined model. The sprawling size of Russia hindered shifting forces between fronts. Large armies were hard to concentrate and supply. Of forces arrayed for the 1805 campaign, many had not seen major combat since Suvorov's Italian expedition in 1799, six years earlier. The veterans of those battles were now few among the rank and file. The army's limited recent experience against the French, aside from some reversals in Switzerland in 1799, left it ill-prepared to face Napoleon's battle-hardened Grand Army. While confident of success, in reality, the Russian army of 1805 was no better prepared than in prior wars, and it now faced a French force perfected through a decade of war into a far more formidable foe. It had to have just been like, Hey guys, come on, let's all go together. We'll all go together. We can do it if we all go together. That's right. They can't though. They won't do it. Not against Napoleon. If they had just told each other what day they were planning to show up to the Uh, battle. That is the thing. (laughs) (laughs) Be here no later than. So overall, deficiencies in logistics, command experience, and integration of reforms remained from Paul's turbulent reign. Steady progress was being made under Alexander, but more time was needed to rebuild the army into an effective modern force. So that is the two main people we're going to be talking about in the Ulm campaign and in the Battle of Austerlitz. Uh, Funny thing to mention here is Britain is the one that brought the coalition together. We're not talking about any British army. Where are they? (laughs) As I was reading the story and just like just reading the source material, I was like, okay, this all starts with the conflict between France and Britain. That's normal. And then I'm like, Okay, here's Austrians. The the Britons got to be coming soon, right? Uh, here's some Russians. The British have got to be coming soon. No, no, not yet. They never did. <laughs> now, okay, to be fair to the British here, we are focusing on Central Europe, Southern Germany. There is, at the same time happening, the Battle of Trafalgar, which is a naval fight that we'll probably talk about at some point in the future, which Britain yeah, was involved a super, in. That's a super awesome battle. Yeah. And uh-huh. I believe the British handed the French their lunch at that battle. Yeah, right? real quick. The British guy, Horatio Nelson, does something that no one should ever do in naval warfare. He crosses his own T. So his dudes are going straight in to the French line, which is completely obliterating them. And guess what? The the British win. And it's an outstanding victory. So we definitely need to talk about that later. So the British were involved in this war, just not on the main military part here at Ullman Austerlitz. Let's talk about the French, though. Uh, We're here to talk about Napoleon and the French, so... After the breakdown of the Peace of Amiens in 1803, Napoleon assembled the Grand Army along the English Channel coast in preparation for an invasion of England. This mobilization provided an unprecedented opportunity for training and reform. Just like our, our last episode on the Spanish Armada, with the Duke of Parma getting ready to invade England. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, so, one, this one has more than just a prayer's chance. Though. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, so the... Napoleon's army was reorganized into standardized regiments, 89 line infantry regiments of three or four battalions each, 27 light infantry, 12 cuirassiers, right? Curiousiers. Curiousiers, 30 dragoon, and 10 hussar cavalry regiments standardized at four squadrons per regiment. Overall, this amounted to 371 battalions of regular infantry and 312 squadrons of regular cavalry. Infantry battalions contained nine companies, of around 120 men each, over 1,000 men per battalion. On paper. On paper. On paper. The months of drills and exercises at camps like Boulogne hone skills to a keen edge. The assemblage of talented generals like Soult, Ney, and Lane, get my French, not good, Lanes, however, provided outstanding leadership. The result was high morale and exceptional combat capabilities when the army mobilized in late 1805. Noteworthy were the units trained at Boulogne under Napoleon's direct supervision. Around 120,000 troops assembled here. These forces executed maneuvers calmly and precisely in 1805, while their extensive musket practice gave superior firepower. When we're talking about the way that the that the French uh, went about their lines of battle, uh, you, we just talked about the, the Austrians, how they had a double man, two ranks, right? Mm-hmm. The way that the French would go into battle is in a block. They'd go in a large block, and as a result, they didn't have the ability to stand and trade volley for volley because they look, they're 10 wide, 10 deep, 100-man companies, 
it's not the firepower that you can get when 10 dudes in front are firing is not very much, but what it does is it provides a battering ram. What the French would do is they would move forward. They'd fire from their front ranks and they would continue on and they Mm. would push into the enemy's lines. And when you are a block of a hundred soldiers, 10 wide, 10 deep, and you're bayonet charging into a two rank rifle, rifle formation, you're going to bust through Mm. and you're going to wreak havoc. And so this is going to be Napoleon's tactic throughout many of the battles that he's absolutely victorious in because the men behind are pushing the men in front to continue mm. on, to keep going because they, there's no real way out. When you're that 37th dude in the center of the battle of the company, you're not going anywhere but forward. So Napoleon's army was integrated with infantry, cavalry, and ample artillery into self-contained core of 25 to 30,000 men. That's I love it. That's combined arms right there. You have that is combined arms. Yeah. Yeah. That that's incredible. And the, the, for them to be self-contained, that's that, that allows them to do so much more on different mm-hmm. uh, fronts of the battle. Yeah. So think of it like U S army moves into Iraq with a brigade combat team, right? That brigade combat team is a self-contained unit where it has infantry, it has mechanized maneuver, it has artillery, and it has its own sustained logistics, right? So these corps can operate by themselves as an army, but they can also come together and just pack a bunch of firepower into one single area. Allowing them to move quickly. When you have 25,000 men moving down this road and 25,000 men moving down a different road, they can converge at a single location faster than 50,000 down one road. Yep. Which is going to come into play much a little bit later here in the battle wall. So seven corps were assembled for the 1805 campaign into Austria, led by Napoleon's best marshals. Four more corps remained as reserve in France and along the Rhine. The Imperial Guard formed an elite reserve of seasoned veterans. Significant forces were left guarding the coast and borders. Three reserve corps formed uh, from 3rd and 4th battalions and cavalry squadrons guarded against invasion and replenished Grand Army losses. Napoleon's administrative planning was meticulous. Chief of Staff Berthier scheduled the march routes and supply dumps needed to move the 210,000 strong Grand Army rapidly over vast distances into Central Europe. So he, Napoleon's fielding 210,000 yep. against max 72,000 and supposedly the Russian right. 130,000. In theory, these two forces are going to be equal mm-hmm. in size. The Grand Army benefited enormously from unified civil military authority. As both emperor and general, Napoleon resolved conflicts between political and military needs. No higher power could override his direction in the field. After a decade of war... France now possessed a formidable 210,000 strong central field army with over 290,000 more troops guarding its periphery. This force was honed for war and governed solely by merit and ability. We're talking like 500,000 soldiers in the French army. And this is really impressive when you talk about only 25 years previous, you have the American Revolution and the majority of the battles of the American Revolution were in the couple thousands. I, our, right. our series on Trenton and Princeton, I think we were talking like a thousand guys. Yeah. Yeah. These battles of the revolution are just nothing. Burgoyne surrenders 7,500 men at the Battle of Saratoga. What do you do? Corn, Napoleon Cornwallis, says. Cornwallis yeah. surrenders 8,000. It's like, this is nothing. Does what that make the, the, the battles of the Napoleonic era though more decisive? Or does that, is it just scale a scale? I think versus, scale, I think scale yeah. a scale, honestly. Yeah, I think it just scales up. I think yeah. it just scales up. All right, let's talk about this movement now into southern Germany. Austria now seeks a surprise attack, but they're going to lack strategic coordination here. So August 1805, an impatient Austrian empire sought to surprise France and seize the strategic initiative by invading the German state of Bavaria, a key French ally providing a gateway to Vienna. Emperor Francis I directed General Karl Mack with leading 72,000 Austrian troops across the Inn River border on August 29th, seizing the Bavarian capital of Munich by September 7th. Control of the Danube River Valley and central Germany hung in the balance. The Austrians hoped this bold thrust into enemy territory would draw Napoleon's Grand Army northeast and away from the Channel Coast. There, the French had massed nearly 200,000 troops throughout the summer of 1805 to threaten England. Austria's ally against Napoleonic dominance on the continent. <laughs> if I was the Austrians, I'd be like, you can keep it, keep your attention on England. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Don't look over here. Don't look over here. But Vienna failed to coordinate the plan with Tsar Alexander of Russia, their other major ally. Austria wrongly assumed 
Alexander would swiftly advance into Central Europe with his armies concentrated in Poland to reinforce Mac if Napoleon responded in strength. To me, you, you got to think, all right, Napoleon has 210,000 guys. Combined, we'll have right around the same, but the Russians are really going to be two-thirds of that. Yeah, I'm going to make sure I'm going to have the Russians with me because otherwise I'm going to be outnumbered three to one. And no, Mac just doesn't do it. He doesn't, he just doesn't talk to Tsar Alexander. <laughs> it's just wild. Yeah, in reality, mobilizing Russia's sprawling land empire took considerable time due to undeveloped infrastructure. Communications and logistics would slow reinforcements over immense distances. Mack also relied on poor intelligence and misjudgment of Napoleon's strategic thinking. He believed the French emperor was firmly fixed in the Channel Coast, finalizing preparations for his cross-channel invasion, when in fact, Napoleon remained flexible, scanning the continent for any opportunity to gain the upper hand. Yeah, when you're fighting against England... Austria, Russia, Sweden's pretending to play the game too. He's obviously looking to replicate instances that he's already seen in the past. Go attack one smaller enemy, destroy them, turn quick, go Mm -hmm. somewhere else, attack them, never allow your enemies to consolidate. He's obviously has to remain nimble throughout this entirety because if he can destroy the British without the Austrians, great. If he can destroy the Austrians without the Russians, great. That's what he's going to do. He remains nimble, he remains flexible, and that's what makes him such a great general. Yeah, so Napoleon immediately recognizes Mack's incursion. It's offering him a sudden, unexpected chance to turn the tables and seize the initiative on land, where France had been relegated to secondary fronts for years. After repeatedly clashing with cautious Austrian advisors like like Archduke Charles, the headstrong Mack craved a bold stroke to restore his reputation, discounting Vienna's concerns about the army's stamina and preparation. This impulsiveness played right into Napoleon's hands. With strategic vision that Mack lacked, Napoleon swiftly ordered the Grand Army to abandon the channel and march hundreds of miles east from the coast into Central Europe. Here, there, they would confront and seek to destroy Mack's overextended, unsupported forces around the Danube before Russian reinforcements could arrive. I don't know. Whenever I see a general that's trying to restore their reputation at the expense of their soldiers that to me is just that's a recipe for failure because you're going to make poor decisions because you're trying to i for those that are into sports gambling you're trying to hit the big parlay that's it's really not going to hit sorry but big risk big reward but that the odds are not going to be in your favor but you're going to make those decisions because you're making it with your heart not with your head and it's just it's not good and it's not going to turn out good for mac The speed and purpose of Napoleon's response would fully demonstrate the French army's superior operational mobility, strategy, resilience, and integration under his undisputed leadership. Never again would he have such an ideal opportunity to deal a knockout blow to an invading opponent in their own territory. So from his Parisian command post, Napoleon rapidly formulated an elaborate operational plan to trap Mack's exposed army and leverage the Grand Army's extensively drilled core system and centralized planning. His strategy aimed to swing mass French strength against the Austrian incursion from multiple directions using fast interior lines before Tsar Alexander's armies could march to their allies' aid. Seven hardened French corps, four allied corps, Marat's cavalry reserve, and the Imperial Guard would commence a massive pivoting maneuver east, marching on converging interior lines from France, the Rhine, and northern Italy. They would funnel together to encircle and crush Mack in Bavaria. I'll just do a real quick side note here. I love the Imperial Guard. These dudes are like hardened veterans. They've been through the entire campaigns for the last 15 years. These dudes are old. They're good. They're the best of the French military. And they bolster some pretty sweet uniforms. Went to France a number of years ago, and they have this Muse de la Armée. They have a museum of the army that's entirely dedicated to the French military, which hilariously enough, focuses mostly on the Napoleonic Wars because they don't have a lot of history after that. But some of the uniforms that these dudes are sporting are pretty cool. They might be fancy boys. So through precise instructions, Napoleon ordered specific routes and timetables for the far-flung corps to follow towards a central rendezvous. Corps marshals, empowered through mission command, would guide the Grand Army's elements together in space and time from across hundreds of miles. But that is that is right there, Napoleon and his planning. You want to talk about what makes a good general? A good general is not just the guy who can sit on the horse and order the armies. Especially and order at this the, time. 
or right. the battalions, a good general is the guy who can set himself up for success. Exactly. From the very first day, from, from, from B day, not D day, B day, A day plus three, he's mm -hmm. ready to go. Orion yeah. is the one who's doing this. Not a single round has been fired. This has all just been preparations, maneuvers. There has been no contact with the Austrians yet. It's just them mm -hmm. working a very well thought out plan. And it's, it's incredible to watch. You're absolutely right. And, and if you can get your army to the battlefield and still their, their bellies are full, their packs are full of ammunition and they're ready to go, you're going to hold yeah. the upper hand. That's right. The other small piece of this that I think is really interesting is the deception plan that Napoleon works here as well, right? So he has his seven core of maneuvering. He's also got some cavalry sitting in the Black Forest that are acting like trying to pull in, pull Mac in and the Austrians in to lure them further west, right? To show and Napoleon's not very strong here. We have a chance to go and take out some of these cavalry. So these cavalry forces in the Black Forest are actually able to drag Mac further west to really set up this envelopment by the seven cores. If Mac took the bait and recklessly extended deep into various expected, the jaws of the French trap would slam shut with a crushing force around Ulm on the Danube before allies could react. By early September, a scattered Austrian army under Mack occupied the strategic Bavarian city of Ulm on the Danube itself. The river offered an excellent logistical corridor for Vienna to supply Mack as he prepared to move east or west. However, the initial Austrian advance into Bavaria had already diluted forces and overextended dangerously. Near Ingolstadt, Mack left 20,000 troops under Field Marshal Reich isolated from the main army at all. So now he's down to 52,000 men. Meanwhile, Tsar Alexander in Poland slowly mustered the first Russian army under General Mikhail Kutuzov, numbering 90,000 troops. They faced a grueling 190-mile march through thinly provisioned Polish countryside to reinforce the Austrians on the Danube. Progress would be steady. That's where everyone needs to stop and think about this. How long would it take a normal person to go 190 miles? Oh man, I'll, uh, I'll tell you what. If you I'm, are if you're cooking, you can get 20 miles a day. If you're for a very well disciplined army that has for, a lot of conditioning, absolutely. Conditioning. That's and, if you're cooking. If you're going at a moderate pace, so you're probably talking 15 miles a day. But even that, like, so we're still so we're talking like 10 days if for yeah. a, like a really highly trained army. And I don't know if the Russians have this intense conditioning. But then they're going to arrive at the battlefield just spent as well. Absolutely. So you're talking a serious investment getting these soldiers 10 days of food, yeah. 10 days of wear and tear on the soldiers' bodies. Take a look at it. You've got Stonewall Jackson and his foot cavalry during the, the campaign that they had over there in, in Western Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley. They, they marched 30 miles a day and they were called foot cavalry because they could march faster and further than anyone else. This is a substantial undertaking. We don't think 20 miles is a long ways until you have to march it. Right. Don't day think. after day yeah. after day and then go fight. Yeah. And then go fight a battle. Good luck. I just think back to our days in ROTC when we were doing rucks together across Minneapolis and like just the accordion with like 40 cadets, like through downtown Minneapolis, like we could barely get any distance on that. I and recently did like a, 90, a Google soldiers. measurement on those. Those bad boys were only like five miles. They were not. Yeah, we sucked at it so we bad. We sucked. It's not bad. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you're talking 90,000 troops to go 190 miles. Uh, yeah, it's going to be steady and slow progress yeah. for these guys. This left an exposed Austrian force of scarcely 50,000 at Ulm to face the oncoming storm as Napoleon's 170,000 highly trained troops successfully channeled towards Bavaria's vulnerable interior on fast marching lines. But that, let's just stop and think about the marching again. I'm back on the marching. <laughs> if your <laughs> army can effectively march faster than your opponents, you will always have the upper hand. That can even go into today's society. Yeah. If your vehicles can remain fueled, if you yeah. can maintain them, and if you can move faster than your enemy, you have the upper yeah. hand. The French in every aspect here when it comes to marching they have the upper hand they're better at it they're better suited to do it they're better capable of doing it logistically and tactically they're capable of doing this they have yeah. the upper hand from day one time timing is so important like sam like our experiences back at the national training center right like even just like how much time 
can you or how quickly can you refuel your vehicles, right? How can you get to the fuel oh line gosh. and get off is so important, especially for you know you your side on on the cavalry side, right? Um, and there yeah, it, like it's refueling is so there's different means of refueling. Do you want to do a service station or do you want to do like a, a drive up? It's so there's it it's everything in your maneuverability, and obviously Napoleon didn't use fuel, but it's it's all the same concept. It's maintaining your ability to maneuver. He used canned goods as fuel. Exactly. Louis, Louis right. Pets Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that guy. Dude, that guy did some spectacular <laughs> stuff. Holy cow. From Paris, Napoleon skillfully maneuvered his forces towards Bavaria, aiming to interpose the Grand Army between Max Exposed Corps around Alm and the approaching Russian reinforcements under Kutuzov. The Grand Army's elaborate corps system enabled powerful dispersed units to concentrate rapidly through closely coordinated marches. As nimble French corps completed epic logistical feats, Mac remained almost stationary at all. His options evaporating. So we have on the French side, Bernadette's, Bernadotte's first corps marched 300 miles southwest from Hanover to Würzburg, south of Ulm by September 30th. Marshal Duval's third corps marched over 250 miles in just 13 days to block Mac's retreat near Vienna to the east. Fourth corps under Marshal Soult marched northeast from the lower Rhine to pin Mac from the northwest. 5th and 6th Corps with Marat's cavalry marched hundreds of miles side by side from France before splitting south and east to encircle Ulm. The Imperial Guard bolstered the French ring closing around Mac from the north. You got to be thinking right now if you're listening to this, the French had to march farther than the Russians did. What's going on? And why were the French able to get there faster? And I think it comes down to two things. I think it comes down to the quality of your logistics. Can you keep your men fed? If they're fed, then they can continue, they can keep up a, a faster pace. And then number two, their task organization, their formation. Yep. We talked about those self-contained units, making them a little bit more nimble, being yep. able to move a little bit more independently. They all know where they need to go. They all need to be at X time on Y yep. date. And so they are able to just be a little bit more nimble. And Napoleon's logistics were just way better. The other thing here too, Sam, from the intelligence perspective is we got to do a little map recon. The infrastructure in Eastern France and Western Germany was way more developed than the infrastructure in Western Russia and through Southern Poland, true. right? So there's a lot more routes that these corps could take. So now we're talking about, and this is where the nimbleness comes in, right? 25 to 30,000 corps on a bunch of different routes instead of 90,000 or however big the Russian army was right. on like one or two roads. And probably way more improved roads and things like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about, look how quickly the Roman army can march right on these highly developed Roman roads. Right. It's the same, it's the same thing here. 250 miles in 13 days. That's. 19 so point that's 19.6 miles on average per day cooking for, for two they're, weeks they're they're cooking away they're cooking yeah. away they're cooking and then so with, just for a, another side note if you're on horseback the average was there's an old time military song that says 40 miles a day on beans and hay so you go 40 miles a day love that so within weeks 170,000 french troops had encircled max 50,000 men through bold maneuver converging on interior lines napoleon's mastery left the methodical Mac outmaneuvered as the trap sprang shut. In October, desperate breakout attempts by the trapped Austrians all failed. Nimble French corps rapidly shifted along the ring circumference, circumference to counter each isolated threat in turn, retaining the operational initiative. Literally here, Napoleon and his men are running circles around the Austrians. So twice, Mac sought to attack west with his full force. A coordinated French corps under the skilled leadership of Marshals Ney and Lanes pre preempted these efforts through rapid response marches converging from the south and the east. So Napoleon, yeah, he's completely certain. He's coming from the Austrians from Austria, basically. <laughs> <laughs> An Austrian breakout eastward was delayed by mounting demoralization confusion until Napoleon himself arrived on October 14th to oversee events and direct a final climatic assault. By then, any hope of escape for Max forces was gone. Completely encircled and battered by intense French bombardment beyond their ability to effectively respond, short on provisions and ammunition and morale plummeting, Austrian commander Karl Mark finally bowed to the inevitable and initiated surrender negotiations with so, Napoleon on the 17th of October. Karl Mack, not Karl Mark. Karl Mark is the <laughs> Karl Mack. socialist. No, that's so, Karl Marx. Well, what Karl I thought Mack. was really interesting <laughs> about the surrender agreement here was that they were entering into this agreement. And the original agreement was actually we were going to surrender on October 25th because they wanted to wait for the Russians oh, to get yeah, there because yeah. they're like, hey, if the Russians yeah. show up, we still want to fight. A diplomatic and, delaying action. 
Yeah, which was super interesting. But by October 20th, Mac looked at his soldiers and he was like, all right, we're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he, his men are starving. He has had no food. They're starving. So 30,000 men surrender on October 20th outside of all. This crushing early blow cost a reckless Austria the strategic initiative they had sought through Mac's audacious offensive into Bavaria. Napoleon had turned the tide completely in his favor in the campaign's opening weeks. So Austria's offensive relied on swift reinforcement by Tsar Alexander's armies concentrated in Poland under General Mikhail Kutuzov. And you might be wondering, where are those Russian armies that <laughs> Mac so desperately needed? Yeah, uh, but inefficient Russian mobilization and logistics failed to support their ally. Inefficient Russian mobilization and logistics. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> A historical calamity for the Russians. Never knew. Anyway, well, right, so. and also, and also, I think it goes back to Mac wanting to seize the initiative, and he just moves towards Ulm, and he probably sent a communication to Russia, but probably, well, uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure, it did not give the Russians enough time to a receive the communication, b mobilize for it, and then c actually get to Ulm in time. I think he just mm -hmm. sent it and wanted to go. Again, he's making decisions with his heart, not his brain. Yeah. Just like every other romantic man. So from Warsaw, Gattuzov methodically mustered the first army, but antiquated supply systems forced his men to gather provisions locally while marching. This Russians with antiquated supply systems? What? Weird. I know, I'm that sorry. Either. That's the last time I make uh, that. Okay. So this, they had, this, it slowed their pace over poor roads through thinly provisioned countryside. Russian communications and coordination was also poor. Kutuzov only learned in late September of Mac's isolated incursion into Bavaria. Far too late to hasten forward deployment. So the Russians didn't even know the Austrians just attacked <laughs> Bavaria. When the campaign's opening weeks, Napoleon had inflicted a catastrophic defeat on Austria, neutralizing over a third of their army. This left Vienna and the Danube exposed. Through vigorous execution driven by Napoleon's vision and firm leadership, France had seized the operational initiative after years of stalemate. But Russia's main forces still remained intact in Poland. Napoleon had won a decisive early victory through maneuver, fast marching, and concentration of force, but his path to ending the war on favorable terms would only get harder from here. Again, I think that this is a super interesting point of Ulm, and again, is, this leads into Austerlitz, which is what we're ultimately talking about, but um, Napoleon won, not with direct contact, but with just being smarter than Mac. Yeah. There was direct contact. There, they did shoot yeah. at each other. But that wasn't what won them the day. What won yeah. them the day was, A, they were super outnumbered. But B, like it was Napoleon's plan Strategic that maneuver. was executed yeah. to perfection. Yeah. Yeah. But we still have tough fighting ahead for Napoleon and his Grand Army against a really large Russian force. But by annihilating Mac's army at Ulm in this orchestrated envelopment on interior lines, Napoleon gained flexibility to drive towards Vienna and force Austria to make peace. General Mikhail Kutuzov commanded Russians' 90,000 men of the First Army slowly marching west to reinforce their Austrian allies when word reached them of Mack's demise. Kutuzov received confirmation on October 23rd while camped at the Austrian city of Krems, just east of Vienna along the Danube. With the main Austrian field army now wiped out, the Russians were still dangerously isolated deep in enemy territory. Facing Napoleon's 170,000 battle-hardened army, Troops approaching from the west after dismantling Mack, Kutuzov concluded that his army lacked sufficient combat strength to directly contest the French juggernaut in open battle at this stage. To avoid being surrounded and potentially forced to surrender like Mack, uh, Kutuzov decided retreat was the only prudent option to shield his army from destruction. So the Russians could not hope to stand alone against Napoleon's massive forces by momentum and geography. So Napoleon pursues the retreating Russians, but he's unable to cut them off. Kutuzov immediately commenced withdrawing his army eastward, behind a strategic barrier of the Danube. The river would secure the Russian line of retreat towards resources and reinforcements from allies in Moravia and Galicia. Kutuzov prioritized preserving his combat power over holding territory or Vienna. French forces eagerly pursued the retreating Russians, seeking to engage and crush their army before it could escape. However, poor roads and the need for extensive reconnaissance prevented Napoleon's troops from cutting off Kutuzov before the Russians successfully crossed the broad Danube at Krems. I feel like the, we'll call it a Fabian strategy of Kutuzov and the Russians here. I feel like that's the Russians go to. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. It's like what they do because they have the geography to do it. They just, mm -hmm. and they go scorched earth on everything so that they can't live off the, the land. And then their supply chains eventually run out and then the Russians win. So it's an interesting tactic. Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you don't place as much value on the territory itself and just 
put more right. value on the security of your soldiers and are willing to, like you said, lengthen your enemy supply lines and then destroy them in detail. It's a good tactic, but it's, it's, it's better than being just annihilated. It's destructive though. Yep. Like you're going to have a lot of cities burn. Yep. So from there, the Russian army retreated 80 miles further east towards Olmutz in Moravia, the site of a recent military camp. Napoleon had driven the Russians back, but his final goal of destroying their field army still remained out of reach. On November 5th, Russian rearguard forces under the determined General Pyotr Bagration turned and offered fierce resistance along the French pursuit at Amstetten. 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 <laughs> 20 miles west of Vienna along the retreat route. Bagration commanded approximately 14,000 Russian troops tasked with shielding the main army's withdrawal. Though outnumbered over two to one by the French pursuers, the Russians made a disciplined fighting stand along a river line. Bagration's men conducted an organized combat retreat for nearly eight hours, contesting every French attempt to cross the river and maintaining cohesion despite mounting casualties. The Russians burned the bridge only once the main body had escaped east. The rear guard action resulted in over 4,000 Russian casualties, bleeding the French advance and buying precious time for Kutuzov's main force to retreat further towards Olmutz in orderly fashion. Napoleon's troops had failed to shatter the Russian army. Though compelled to withdraw after hours of intense combat, Bagration's sacrificial stand underscored Russians' willingness to absorb punishment to shield Kutuzov's force. This operational resilience and retreat set the stage for deciding the campaign soon after at Austerlitz. So after retreating nearly 300 miles from Vienna, Kutuzov's Russian First Army finally reached the Moravian city of Olmutz at, on November 9th. Here they joined with General Buxhauden's Russian Second Army of 45,000 men arriving from Poland. Man, that would be super annoying if I was a Russian soldier who had just spent a considerable amount of time and effort marching towards Vienna. <laughs> now I'm just getting <laughs> miles further away from yeah. Vienna. I'd be foot sore. I can just imagine how soldiers are talking about it too. This <laughs> go one way, now we go another way. Oh, same shit, well, different day. But then only for bad gration. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the lucky thing for these soldiers is that they're doing this in like October and September, October, November time period. Imagine doing this in July. They didn't have a great oh. grasp on dehydration, heat exhaustion. They didn't understand these yeah. things. They didn't realize that humans yeah. have an extent to which they can't go any further. And those dudes would just fall by the wayside. They didn't have a, hey, you should be drinking two quarts of water every two yeah. They didn't have that. If your pee's yellow, you should drink some water. They didn't yeah, Igor, what that. color is your urine? <laughs> yeah, they didn't have that. And so it's very interesting. These stragglers, had they had a better concept of hydration or heat, managing heat, um, this, the straggling could have been immensely uh, reduced. Yeah. So the two Russian armies combining at Olmutz now presented a formidable allied force of around 135,000 troops to continue the war against Napoleon's army. Moravia offered a location to regroup away from the advancing French. However, French forces had already seized the strategic prize of Vienna on November 14th unopposed. Napoleon was now poised in the Austrian heartland to drive for a decisive victory. Despite now outnumbering, it's just, it's almost like a, a side to history here. Oh, and Napoleon conquered the capital of Austria. <laughs> like that. <laughs> it's walked, walked right in. Walked yeah. right in here. Their whole, he already captured their army at Alm. There, there was nothing left. And so he, yeah. I think he did just walk right in. So despite now outnumbering the French after uniting the two Russian armies at Almut, Kutuzov made the controversial decision to continue retreating rather than stand and fight. Kutuzov still lacked confidence in facing Napoleon's battle-hardened army in open battle. The Russian troops remained demoralized after their long fighting retreat from Vienna and a subsequent <laughs> surrender. Yeah, I'd be really tired and I'd need new yeah. shoes. <laughs> yeah. I need new shoes. My feet hurt, sir. <laughs> Guess what? Now your back's going to hurt because you're just <laughs> landscaping duty. <laughs> nice. I like that. Oh, man. All right. Where was I here? God, that was funny. <laughs> All right. So the Russian commander also recognized Napoleon's superior cavalry gave the French a substantial edge in intelligence, pursuit, and controlling the battlefield. Kutuzov hoped to neutralize these advantages by pulling Napoleon deeper into hostile territory stretched far from his supply lines. By declining open battle, Kutuzov aimed to gain time through storm morale, integrate the disparate allied forces, and allow Prussian intervention. However, this constant retreating 
forfeited any chance to coordinate effective counterattacks against the French strategic advantage. And to restore morale, geez, like I'm, I'm so annoyed because yeah. I've marched so far and I'm going to retreat some more. Yeah. <clears throat> so the seizure of Vienna provided Napoleon with a central base to resupply using captured Austrian resources. The city also offered a vital bridgehead across the Danube. From Vienna, French corps fanned out to secure strategic positions and forage supplies in Austria, fortifying Napoleon's hold. Marshal Bernadette's first corps drove east to isolate Prague and guard against Prussian intervention. Other French marshals, other French marshals secured vital river crossings, allowing Napoleon to shift forces between the Danube's northern and southern banks to track allied movements. Cavalry patrols gathered intelligence across the countryside. Napoleon's consolidation around Vienna and control of the Danube put him in an increasingly unassailable position. He worked tirelessly to anticipate allied moves and counter Kutuzov's attempts to delay a decision. Bjorn, one thing that you and me have talked about in probably every single series that we've done here is armies win with intelligence, right? Like you use your cavalry effect. Yeah. <laughs> Sam rolls. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I do is really important, guys. Okay. But it's, man, if a general knows what the situation is in front of him and to the sides and behind him, he can make good decisions on the battlefield and set his army up for success in a conflict. If you don't do that and you go into something blind, you tend to make bad decisions. I think back to Antietam, right? Both armies use really poor intelligence and they both made really bad decisions in that, in that fight at Antietam. And it happens pretty consistently. If you don't use your horse effectively to gain intelligence and to gain contact with the enemy, you're going to have a bad time in the battle. I think well, and even, even Mac in this battle, his intelligence said that the Grand Army was going to be pinned up on the English Channel, yeah. waiting to invade the British Isles, and that was wrong. So That's I think there's a new, like a new competition here. Maybe a listener can email us or something to find at the Monday Morning General at gmail.com. The greatest victory with the worst intelligence. Ooh, Ooh. the greatest victory with the worst okay. intelligence. Because I'm racking my brain right now trying to think in what scenario is the rule. Not the rule, because yeah. the rule is you need to know where your enemy is yeah. at all times. And what situation did someone just walk in the door and own the house? Yeah. I, we got to figure it out. That's that our is a really homework. interesting one. That's yeah. our new homework. All right. Ooh. Oh, I like it. Okay. So the Allies and the Allies, Russia and Austria, had reunited substantial forces at Olmutz, but failed to achieve real strategic concentration or initiative. Kutuzov's continuing retreats forfeited any chance to mount effective counterattacks against the French strategic advance. Napoleon's decisive victory at Austerlitz weeks later would shatter the new coalition's hopes before they could regain momentum. The Allies' best opportunity to turn the tide slipped away at Olmutz, while Napoleon further solidified his dominating position. Napoleon's decisive early victory against Austria left the continent ripe for shaping based on his grand vision. In just weeks, his grand army had dismantled a major field army and driven Russian forces back in disarray. Now the French emperor stood poised to force a peace settlement with a demoralized Austria and alter the balance of power. Yet, Russia remained defiant under Alexander, its vast resources still intact. Napoleon hoped to avoid a major battle against this mighty foe if possible, seeking to consolidate gains diplomatically. But Alexander was rallying his forces, reinforced by arriving troops. The Tsar dreamed of smashing Napoleon in an epic contest between the champions that would decide Europe's destiny. Only through shedding blood could a lasting outcome now be forged. The time for war on a grand scale had arrived. Napoleon's path ahead lay across Moravia to engage the concentrated might of Russia in open battle. There on the plains outside Austerlitz, the titans would finally collide to determine who would control the fate of Europe. The stakes could not have been higher. Napoleon marched towards his greatest triumph, a victory so complete it would puncture myths of Russian might. Yet fate hung in the balance. Boldness and brilliance had brought Napoleon to the doorstep of continental mastery. But on the frozen December field of Austerlitz, courage alone would decide whether he seized the mantle of greatness awaiting him or stumbled before reaching the precipice of glory. And that's where we'll pick up next time on part two of our series of the Battle of Austerlitz. Ah, I just, I feel so bad for Archduke Charles of Austria. Yes. Because if, if pe he was saying the whole time, guys, we're not ready to go to war. And everyone was like, shut up, nerd. We don't like you. <laughs> And they had just listened to him. If they had just listened to him, Napoleon still probably would have won. Still probably <laughs> well, be real. But just, maybe not I, as decisively as he did. And maybe Napoleon wouldn't have moved. Like Napoleon started moving yeah. because Mac moved. Good point. 
That's a good Best point. choice for the Austrians. Don't join the coalition. Be like, yeah. we're going to sit this one out, guys. Yeah. yeah. And sit this one out. Yeah, like Prussia. Yeah, Prussia's, we're yeah. not getting into this. This is not our, this is not our get oh, anymore. Oh, not, it's they, super interesting because Prussia is just the next door neighbor of Bavaria, right? Yeah, yeah but it is. They'd been, they'd been handed a pretty decent stomping. One final question for Bjorn. Did you play as Napoleon in the Ulm campaign in Total War? Oh, heck yeah, man. Noah was the one who really liked playing as England. I like to play as Napoleon. Did England nice. even play in the Battle of Ulm? Oh, they weren't there. But <laughs> that's why Noah liked it. That's why Noah liked it. No decisions to be made. <laughs> Just All right. We love you, Noah. That's good stuff. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Like we said, if you have any comments, please someone go and fight. Yeah. Has there been any major victory when intelligence wasn't a thing or wasn't used to achieve that victory? We are very curious. That Monday morning so general, gmail.com. That's right. Good job, Sam. Also, a review would be nice. What do you think about this? Feel free to email us and just give us feedback too. We'd love to hear it. Anyways, we're excited to talk in depth about this battle. Next time, one of Napoleon's greatest victories. Everyone will catch you on the other side. MMG out.